welcome everyone. This is this is the fifth of uh, John Jackson's wonderful uh, presentations about the Old Testament, and this one is one that's near and dear to uh, Jungian hearts because it's about Answer to Job, which was probably Dr. Jung's most controversial book uh, during his lifetime. Let me uh, introduce John Jackson. Go ahead, John. Well, thank you for having me back again. This was actually supposed to have been presented a couple of weeks ago, but we had some big fires going on here, uh, which got a little bit close to where I live, uh, not so close to Jerry, but we also had the smoke and evacuations were happening around us and uh, appreciate being able to you know, delay it a little bit. And we're actually having a little sunshine. The wind has changed. I think it's all been. I think the smoke's being all blown in your direction now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me just ask everyone to, to mute yourselves, uh, if you will, uh, so that we don't have interfering sound with John. And I, I wanted to comment, you know, the, the noise we were hearing, I mean, the sound of you reading reminded me that uh, you did do that. Uh, audio recording of the book of Job or of the answer to Job. Uh, and there is no other audio uh, available of that book. Uh, and the way I like to study is I like to listen to the book and I have the book in my hand at the same time. Yeah, and I did it. I did it for that reason because I want to, I wanted to listen to it too. And so I had yeah. to re read it in order to be able yeah. to listen to it myself. So that was really nice and very helpful. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if I can do that. Everybody seeing that? Well, let's see from the current slide. So, yeah, this is my uh, my series on a psychological approach to the Old Testament. There's ten lectures all together. Um, we divided uh, one of them in half, uh, the one on women in the Bible, uh, the last couple of uh, presentations, and I've g given some portions of the lectures. And uh, so this one is, uh, like you say, Dear to Heart, um, the Book of Job, and uh, Young's response to Job. Um, and I, I thought a good place to start, actually, is this uh, quotation from Job, uh, chapter 19. Would then that my words were written, that they were inscribed in a book with an iron pen and lead to be hewn in rock forever. That's a wonderful bit of poetry to begin with. Um, and you do know something about this text now that we didn't know uh, until fairly recently is the iron pen and lead. Um, what he's talking about there is the iron pen is a chisel. And you're chiseling um, away, writing in stone. And then what they would do is they take powdered lead and spew it onto the uh, the rock. Um, and what that would do, uh, you know, among all the other things that are written in stone, these things would have kind of a hue or a glow to them, which meant that it was a partic particularly special text. Um, so it's interesting, you know. I love this. Uh, I love this thought, and then I say to myself, "Well, if only, if only Job's words had been written down, right, and hewn in rock forever." Well, I think very much in a way they have been. Job, uh, as you know, is part of the wisdom literature, which uh, was very common throughout the ancient Near East, um, uh, particularly well developed in Egypt. Um, Egypt had one thing in particular that they did that others didn't so much do is they had a whole um, body of wisdom literature um, that would tell you how to behave in the royal court uh, if you happen to be meeting with the pharaoh or with some uh, particular uh, official in Egypt. But um, uh, wisdom literature as a whole was also quite well developed in Egypt. And wisdom literature. Uh, is really noted for a wide range of topics, varying, varying perspectives, which often would disagree with each other. 
um, and many different emotions. Um, and these were uh, some of the themes that um, you would find in wisdom literature, praise of human intelligence, tried and true traditional advice, what is proper social behavior, what is moral behavior, what is the meaning of human life, and why is life the way that it is. It was an international, as I say, uh, uh, art form or uh, literature form, not just local, but there's one difference and one exception to that, which is that the Hebrew wisdom literature was monotheistic and none of the other nations had monotheistic uh, uh, writings or, uh, or anything until much later. So uh, in the various different forms of the Hebrew Bible, the uh, Protestant Bible, the Catholic Bible, um, these are the books that are uh, usually called wisdom literature, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, and uh, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. And today, of course, we're looking at the story of Job. So I thought I'd give a quick rundown. A wealthy man from the land of Uz lives a life that is blameless and upright. So um, it's been a lot of uh, discussion about where or what is the land of Uz. Um, in terms of physical locations, there's a couple of uh, suggestions. One is up in the northern part of Canaan and the other is down in the southwestern part of Canaan. But in any event, they're looking at Canaan. And in fact, um, as we'll talk about, I do think that this originally was an ancient Canaanite story. Um, and the issue uh, of him being blameless and upright also is another thing we'll mention in a, in a while. Um, this becomes an issue over time because as it enters into the Hebrew Bible, uh, rabbinical scholars uh, would say, well, how could he have been blameless and upright if he wasn't Jewish? So there are these theories that uh, I, I believe the, one of the relatives of Abraham had a son of a son uh, whose name was Uz. Uh, so they've tried to tie him in to being part of the family of uh, Abraham. I don't think that was the case, but who knows? Uh, he probably wasn't a historical figure, um, but people debate that also. Um, in any event, one day, as God is meeting with his counsel, the adversary joins them. Now, the adversary, the Ha Satan, or the Satan, um, this actually was a court position. Um, that everyone would know what they were talking about. There's a parallel in the East, uh, you know, where you had to kowtow and you had to touch your forehead to the floor uh, to honor the emperor or whichever, you know, whoever official that you're um, bowing to. And there was a person in the court whose job it was to make sure your forehead touched the floor. Not an eighth of an inch, not a quarter of an inch off the floor. Your forehead touched the floor. Well, this is a comparable court position. This is his job is to say, oh, come on. You know, God's bragging about Job and the adversary. His job is to say, no, 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 no. He doesn't love you. He doesn't worship you. He loves the things you give him. He loves everything, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's come to mean something else now that... Uh, this has also become a Christian document, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So the adversary says, no, nah, it's all a sham. And God, strangely, and very quickly, agrees to put Job to the test. And everything that Job has is taken away from him, including his health, but he refuses to abandon God. So three of Job's friends come to visit, and they demonstrate proper behavior. They sit in silence with him for seven days, and then they dialogue with him. And each one of them takes a position. And I think it's been demonstrated, again, in rabbinical studies that each one of the positions of the three friends is a particular theological position that's being argued. But they all agree that Job must have done something terribly wrong because innocent men do not suffer as he is suffering. Job, on the other hand, maintains his innocence 
and he muses on the relationship between humans and God, and his friends are offended by what he's saying. They think it's blasphemous. But Job wants to ask God why wicked men thrive and good men suffer. So at this point, there's a break. Um, a hymn to wisdom is heard. It is a piece of poetry. Um, it's another one of these uh, things like uh, Miriam's song, um, a song of the sea after the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, it's another one of these ancient, ancient poems, and it's been inserted here into this also ancient story. Um, and then a fourth friend who's not mentioned in uh, otherwise than these uh, speeches that he gives, Elihu, appears with yet another point of view. He does agree that sufferings, uh, that somehow Job must be at fault, but he offers the idea that sufferings are meant to teach a lesson, um, which is something that the other friends didn't say. But Job continues to demand a confrontation with God. And God now appears in a whirlwind and speaks and challenges Job with the vastness of creation, with his powers of God, as God, saying that Job knows nothing about what is, and he does not answer any of Job's questions as to why this is happening. Some people uh, hear this a lot, is that God's actually kind of bullying Job. Um, uh, other people say, no, he's just simply pointing out that things don't operate the way Job thinks they do. Um, Job surrenders, and I think that word is important. He doesn't submit, he surrenders. He gives up the ideas, what he had believed. Or um, Anyway, he's not submitting in, um, in the way that some people have suggested. God then rebukes the first three friends. In fact, they have to pay, do penance, and they have to do it through Job, because Job did speak rightly these things that his friends uh, considered blasphemous. And then Job gets everything back twofold. He gets his family back. Um, he gets uh, all of his belonging, his animals, his home, his life, basically. And everything is restored. Brief summary of Job. In any other book in the Hebrew Bible, the book of Job is considered an all-time classic of world literature. Um, the, the depth and the uh, profoundness of the poetry is beyond anything else in the Hebrew Bible. It's brilliantly conceived, brilliantly executed. Um, and to some extent, the poet even created a new Hebrew language, made up new words by borrowing words from Aramaic and combining them with uh, Hebrew ideas. Uh, this has made translating difficult. Um, but the um, book of Job is often described as the primary book in the Bible that addresses the problem of evil in the world and the meaning of human suffering. Over the centuries, it's been interesting how differently the book has been uh, interpreted first uh, uh, even through rabbinical st studies, it's changed over time. Um, and particularly in the Christian uh, culture, uh, there have been eras of interpretation um, right up to our time. We have a new one with uh, Carl Jung. The, and I mentioned this before, whether or not Job was Jewish uh, became a uh, central concern in rabbinical studies. Um, and I think, in essence, he is Jewish uh, in, in those studies or in, in that uh, way of thinking um, because of his uprightness and his, uh, uh, his life. Job is also the most mysterious of all of the books in the Hebrew Bible. For one thing, it uses a much larger vocabulary than any other book in the Hebrew Bible. Um, the Hebrews typically used very restricted language in their religious writing. And there's things they just didn't write about. They didn't write about everyday things. They didn't write about um, you know, the market. They didn't write about 
the everyday life, uh, those things don't uh, appear. And uh, there are certain topics weren't discussed. A lot of words weren't used. It's very restricted language. Um, there's a technical term, patax leomena, and that's used to refer to words that appear in no other book of the Bible or elsewhere. Again, um, these made up words. Um, and the section featuring Elihu uses yet an entirely new vocabulary, different than the rest of the book of Job, and the poetry there is much less elegant. So Job has obvious Greek influences with the Aramaic, and some people have said, it, it comes across, I, I believe that Young said this, didn't he, that uh, it often comes across as if you're watching a philosophical stage play, and it's being played out in front of you. You can imagine yourself sitting in an amphitheater watching this uh, being performed on a stage. Traditionally thought to have been written about 500 BCE, which would be uh, just after the time of the Babylonian uh, captivity, the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, the destruction of the temple. And that would make sense uh, because suddenly we, you know, the Jews, the Hebrews lost everything. Uh, the northern kingdom had been destroyed before, and now the southern kingdom is destroyed. People are taken into captivity, uh, and it's all gone. On the other hand, it could be an older story, or maybe written much more recently with you know the Greek influence and the Aramaic. It may be a very old folk tale, but written down much later. And I think uh, I mentioned before. I think this is probably true. I think it's a Canaanite. Uh, folk tale. Um, and there are references in uh, Job to the Psalms and to the creation story in Genesis. And there are references to the Sabians and uh, to the gold of Ophir and to ancient Canaanite myths and individuals. Leviathan comes up several times in the uh, story, um, that old symbol of chaos. The Sabians were an Arabian uh, nomadic tribe, and they're the ones that uh, raided, and uh, I forget at the moment if they killed the animals or if they, uh, I, believe that, I believe that's what they did, they killed and stole the animals. The gold of Ophir um, was the gold that uh, Solomon uh, stockpiled um, when he built up Jerusalem and particularly built the temple. So uh, that gives us some kind of reference time-wise, but again, it's all over the map. Um, and there's been a lot of difficulty and there, there is no overall agreement as to when the book actually was put together. Um, Job ends and ends with prose. Um, if you look on the far left, you see the gray prologue area and on the far right, the gray epilogue. Uh, but also, the prose includes God speaking from the whirlwind and Job's response, and again, God speaking from the whirlwind and Job's response. So that portion is prose, um, and then the middle section is poetry. Um, the central part of the book is profound poetry, and again, many of the words derived from Aramaic. It's not clear which came first, the prose parts at the beginning and the end, or the middle part. Um, in fact, when I first learned about these things, you know, when I was in school years ago, um, I believe that they said that they thought that uh, the middle section was the older part and the prose part was newer. I think it, the thinking has switched now. But again, people have trouble dating these things. In any event, this is a compiled document um, with prose, prologue, and epilogue, and a beautiful uh, poetry middle, and then some other poetry added as well. Um, but the overall document as a whole, which is the way it's meant to be taken, is a masterpiece of literature. Now, if we look at the, at the, the, the real poetry, the, the, the deep, beautiful poetry, part of it's missing. Um, the Hebrews like to do things in threes, and um, 
this was also true in the book of Genesis, the six days of creation, was actually presented in two three-day sets. And there was a cycle that repeated day one, day four, day two, day five, day three, day six. There was a, a, a cycle that repeated. And again, here we see a cycle of three, except the third cycle is uh, not complete. Bildad's chapter 25 is abbreviated. It's, it looks like it's been cut short. And Job's reply. And then chapter 27, uh, what they say is that it looks like it was like cut, you know, cut and paste. It was rearranged. Um, and it makes reference to things that haven't happened yet. Um, it's kind of a curious thing. It probably this was done in an effort to kind of complete the three, you know, the cycle of threes. Um, but it's uh, evidence that, in fact, the document's damaged and part of it was lost at some point. And this new material was added, the interlude to wisdom and the speeches of Elihu, and again, the prose ending. This probably was done because without this portion of the book of Job, um, it basically was considered pretty blasphemous. And there was, it almost did not make it into the Old Testament uh, or to the Hebrew Bible. Um, but by adding these things, particularly the idea that suffering teaches a lesson and having an interlude on, or a poem to, uh, or a hymn to wisdom, this made it more acceptable. Um, and it did make it, as we know, into the Hebrew Bible or what we now call the Old Testament. Again, there are many words and phrases that are difficult to translate, and the meanings are not clear. Um, uh, and it, it's a task. Uh, you talk, listen to translators talk about it, and it's a difficult thing. And different translators have approached it in different ways, which is why some versions of Job um, have a different message than other versions of Job. Uh, one interesting approach was Stephen Mitchell, famous translator. He just decided he's going to just throw all of that stuff out. He says it's a corrupt text. He doesn't think these are made up words or poetic words. Uh, he just thinks it's corrupted. And he, any of the lines and the words and the entire hymns of wisdom and all of Elihu's speeches are not in his translation. He threw them out. These are the ones uh, listed here. And you can see he took out quite a bit of stuff in his version. The recorded version, by the way, um, of uh, Stephen Mitchell's translation, um, the audio is uh, recorded by Peter Coyote, and it's actually a really good recording. Uh, and I recommend that if you're interested in listening to audio. But it will not include these portions. Now, the later Christian reinterpretation of the Book of Job has changed some, you know, many of the original elements. In particular, the accuser, Ha Satan, has become the Christian Satan in the same way that the serpent in Eden has, has become Satan. Um, that wasn't the way that the Hebrews thought about it. And as I mentioned, the accuser actually was a role, a uh, recognized role in the court um, in uh, the Middle East, the ancient Middle East. And also, of course, um, Job never once, in all of the things he says and wishes and hopes for, he never once expects deliverance in the afterlife, uh, which again suggests something about when this story is from, because that wasn't, the Hebrews didn't believe in life after death until the Greek influence came in, because that's a Greek idea. Um, the, the, you know, the all-powerful, omniscient God, life after death, a number of things. We talked about this before, that those are Greek ideas, and they came in much later. Um, we could, um, at this point, uh, stop and discuss for a little bit, if you want to, before going on to talk about the book of Job, per se. Um, what do you think, Skip? What would you like to do? You're uh, muted. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, discuss by all means. Yeah. Um, 
I think it, yeah. I'd like to ask. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. John, thank you for the, such a beautiful overview. I think um, why I was drawn to this particular lecture is I want to know what is the meaning of suffering? And mm. I'd like to kind of open that up because I think um, that's the crux of this whole um, argument between Job and God. Um, mm. Why did an innocent, a good, quote, good man have to suffer? Mm. And I leave that open to everyone to, to bring in their two cents. I think it's related to uh, the story of uh, Pandora, actually, in a way, the Greek story. You know, Pandora was made by Hephaestus. She actually was an android, you know, an artificial woman. Um, and her box was not a box. It was a jar, which kind of shaped like a uterus, like those old jars were. And she would have been giving birth to all of these different things, these things that, uh, you know, the evils that came into the world, the ones you couldn't get out was hope, if you remember. And it's really basically a Greek story that is answering the question of why are there, why do these things happen? Why do we suffer? Why do we die? And the answer in Greece anyway was because we're born. It's the way life is. But what do other people think? I see Anne with a hand up. Go ahead. Anne is muted. Well, this is Doreen. Hi. Hi. Um, I can't speak to the issue of suffering. I mean, I think that, that is, that's like the question, right? And um, uh, however, I have a, an additional I don't know whether it's time because I want to respect, uh, is it Joss, uh, her question yes. in terms of why do we suffer? Um, but I have a second thing that I wanted to raise when the time is right. Mm -hmm. um, if I may ask you before, uh, um, I am Greek and I wanted um, to ask you where is this expression apax legomena that you've mentioned is um, is mentioned it's very interesting because i am studying the lucinian mysteries and mm -hmm. legomena was a part of the mysteries and of course the mysteries had suffering a lot because the goddess herself had to suffer mm -hmm. um so apax legomena means spoken only once isn't it mm. uh, in ancient Greek? So it's extremely interesting what you have just uh, mm -hmm. mentioned about it. Yeah, I Thank believe you. I believe I got that term out of uh, Bishop's book, which I'll show you the cover of in, in a moment. But yeah, I, I was unfamiliar with that term before. Thank you for explaining that. I appreciate that. Just in my own life. Uh, Suffering has caused me to go inward mm -hmm. and develop the inner life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true. I mean, we can say that about the time that we're living in right now, you know, with the virus. Um, I heard a, a talk by, uh, uh, what is her name, Jean Shibota Bolin, who lives here in uh, Marin County, um, saying that this is our liminal time. We're in the womb and we're about to be born into a new life of some sort. Uh, and I, I think you're right that there's a, if we learn the lesson that we need to learn from this virus, that's exactly what we need to do is go inward. You know? It seems to me, John, that um, all religions were founded and developed to address the problem of suffering and the point of living and um, it's interesting that through the history of so many religions um, good behavior or moral behavior or 
um, what is ever considered best behavior uh, is recommended to alleviate suffering, was recommended to, um, you know, or a spiritual path, getting close to the God of whatever religion is recommended to um, alleviate the suffering because you see the cause for it or you understand better the reasons for your suffering. Um, and it's also sad to say that so many religions have used, have weaponized that, you know, if you're not close to God or if you're living a bad life, they weaponize it. And, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, well, that's one of the things that, that was brought up by uh, the three fellows that were against or that insisted that Job must have done something wrong. That's the whole theme, which is that if you hadn't done something wrong, God would not have put this pox upon you, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which really is what a lot of uh, Christians today and i say this as you know i was married for many years to a born-again christian who was himself also abusive um and was able to cherry pick and find some reason for everything mm -hmm. um that he did and there is just that whole contingent within the christian community that um believes that that if you are good then god will bestow upon you riches uh, that's the whole, you know, name it and claim it group uh, within, you know, you see these very mega churches and whatnot uh, that have these ways that you can become wealthy. And they so are against the Jungian concept of, of using that, that suffering is the way inward, as uh, I think Nancy just said. Um, anyway. Yeah, we do hear that. Uh, I mean, how many times have one of those evangelical preachers come out and said, Hurricane Katrina was because you allow homosexuality, and, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, yeah, we do hear that. And AIDS. I mean, that was the big thing about AIDS, that it was brought upon us because of the sinning. You know? Right. Yeah. I just want to um, refer to the terminology compassion, come meaning with passion. It means like with suffering. Mm -hmm. So um, it brings a richer meaning to the term suffering. So even in reference to um, is it the Red Book? Uh, Skip, uh, I'm not too familiar, but I was just uh, learning a little bit about scrutinies. I think in that um, uh, story, I think uh, Philemon uh, introduces CJ to the, quote, the blue shade. And the blue shade is supposed to represent uh, Christ. And uh, so the blue shade tells Jung, hey, listen, I got a gift for you. <laughs> it says, oh, okay, wow, what, what kind of gift is this? I mean, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what got me was uh, the blue shade says, well, my gift to you is the beauty of suffering. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, this must have been a, you know, um, a surprise to to Jung because you know he's gone through every, all all that he went through um, described in the Red Book and the last standing you know to, towards his experiences I'm going to bring you suffering so what it does it all mean I I kind of agree with Nancy you know it's an opportunity to go deeper deeper into the self to find that divine um, within. And finally, like even what, um, in, and again, reference to Joseph Campbell would say, you have to go through all that in, in order to get to the ecstasy or the sublime. So it's 
again, um, a pathway, a passage for man to go through, uh, one of the kind of like obstacle courses to get to the gold. Yeah. Um, I have so much to say about this, but right now what I want to say is that Gurdjieff, whom I studied with a student of Gurdjieff's for 10 years, talked about the difference between conscious suffering and unconscious suffering and made the point even more that if we are able to suffer in a conscious way, we actually relieve the suffering of God. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, has kind of gotten me through 30 years of a Job-like experience. Because to feel that, first of all, that you're not united with God in that suffering, and that even God can be changed by our joining in with conscious suffering. And it, therefore, it's considered a great privilege, which has got another side to be said for it. Great. Thank you. That, that is exactly where we're about to go um, when we talk now about Young's answer to Job. Any other last final comments? Uh, shall we return to uh, the story? Yeah, go, go ahead, John. I, I uh, have, I, I'm, I have too many things going on right now in my head <laughs> about okay. it, but yeah. I'll, I'll pipe up at the end. Good. Okay. Okay, let's see. Oops, I went back to the other place. So we're, uh, pardon me while I find the proper spot here. Ah, there it is. Young's answer to Job. This is the uh, original hardback uh, before it was incorporated into the uh, um, the collected works. And uh, these are the two main books that I would recommend. Uh, one of them, I think you guys are real familiar with. I think you've spent some time looking at Transformation of the God Image uh, by Edward Edinger. Um, the second one, the one by Paul Bishop, was, was unknown to me. I didn't know about this book. It was recommended by uh, John Beebe. And he covers a lot of the same territory. It's got a lot of additional information in it as well. Um, the main thing that struck me is I, I think his attitude is a little harsher toward Jung. Um, not that he doesn't like Jung, obviously, um, or believe that he was brilliant. Um, but I would say that Paul Bishop is a post-Jungian as opposed to Edinger, who was a Jungian. Um, and then that would make sense to me that John Beebe would recommend a post young in to me because he often talks in those kind of terms nowadays. These are both excellent books and we're going to uh, take a look at uh, parts of, uh, of them as we go along. But first I want to back up and just in a very general way uh, talk about what's called theodicy, which is this question of why would an all good, all powerful God allow evil to exist in the world? And there have been different approaches uh, over time. Uh, Leibniz is uh, famous for his, uh, the best of all possible worlds. Okay, it could be worse, could be better, but this is the best of all possible worlds, which is basically saying we don't know enough to answer the question. Harold Kushner, uh, it's one of the proponents of the idea of human free will um, and that suffering is teaching. Um, and, you know, it's this idea that God created mankind, humans, with free will, and because of that, he's not going to intervene um, in human affairs and he's going to let them play out. Um, my personal view on that is I think the experiment has been played out long enough. I think intervention would be fine at any point. <laughs> But um, St. Augustine, or St. Augustine, um, had a point of view, and this is also a point of view shared by C.S. Lewis, uh, that there are natural laws. Actions have consequences. Uh, there's cause and that there's effect. 
which is definitely true in, in Lang. Um, and then Alfred North Whitehead um, had an idea, which is process theology. Um, and his idea is, well, we need to change our image of God. Rather than ask that question or try to answer that question. So these first three all maintain the view that God is all good and all powerful, but they try to address it in different ways. But Jung's view actually arises out of Whitehead's process theology that we need to change our image of God, change our understanding. The answer to Joe was written in 1951, the year I was born. And during uh, some kind of illness with a high fever, and von Franz is the one who's told us that it was one burst of energy with strong emotion or strong passion, a very passionate piece of work. The initial draft, uh, apparently, Sandushani, uh, yes, Sandushani, I'm sorry, Sandushani uh, told us. Uh, this bit, that the initial draft was strongly anti-Christian, so much so that uh, Young's secretary at the time was shocked and considered it blasphemous. Um, and so Young rewrote the initial portion of the book. Um, and what's interesting is that that original manuscript of the first draft is missing. Um, it's not in the collected papers um, it's not known to be anywhere. Um, we don't know if it was destroyed or what, but anyway, it can't be found at this point. So we don't know exactly what it was that he wrote. On the other hand, uh, even the rewritten version was considered blasphemous by a lot of uh, Christian theologians. Young even lost a, a good friend uh, because of this book. Young's intent was to replace the all good Christian God image with a newer one in which God is all things and all inclusive. Uh, and this is one of the differences uh, in my presentation uh, because Jung uh, saw the Old and the New Testaments as one complete story, one complete myth psychologically. And he tended to do this primarily via the Gnosticism, Hebrew wisdom literature, and other sources uh, uh, in terms of thinking like that. Um, my presentations are strictly Old Testament. Um, so I'm not going to go into that part of the answer to Job where he takes on the birth of Christ and the death of Christ um, and then the book of Revelation um, as the fulfillment of that long story, that long psychological story, which he saw as the foundation of Western culture and Western thought. He saw the transformation of Yahweh in Job as being the event that directly leads to God incarnating as Christ so that he can experience human sufferings and also to punish himself with death uh, because of his past evil deeds. It's an interesting idea. Now here's a quote from Paul Bishop. Um, in Young's view, the events of the Hebrew Bible can be seen in terms of a four-stage development. First, there's the creation, closely followed by the development of consciousness in humankind, the fall of man, which is the apple in, or the fruit in the uh, Garden of Eden. Third, Yahweh's encounter with Job, which leads finally to the event foreshadowed by the prophets, the incarnation, the coming of the Messiah, God incarnates as a human being. A couple of quotes from Edinger, and this is from just the opening portion of his book, Answer to Job can be seen, uh, can be considered a depth psychological examination of the Judeo-Christian myth, which is at the core of the Western psyche. Answer to Job continued the study of the Western God image, which is to say he continued from the book of Ion. He went even further in answer to Job, and in particular explores how human consciousness changes the nature of that God image. When he talked about God image, um, the self, that part of ourselves, um, and 
is it the same as God? He, Jung would say, no, it's not the same, but it's as close as we get. It's, it's our image of God. Um, and that um, is a technical point in uh, Jungian thought. Now, I think Edinger's a little bit wrong in saying that this idea was new with Carl Jung. And I'll show you this example. I'll show you another one at the very end. Uh, this one's from Frederick Hegel. To grasp in thought correctly and definitely what God is as spirit, that requires thorough speculation. To begin with, this contains the following propositions. God is only God insofar as he knows himself. His knowing himself is, furthermore, a self-consciousness in man and man's knowledge of God that goes on to man's knowing himself in God. I think slightly older language, but I think this is actually very similar, very similar idea to what it is that Jung was talking about. And here's uh, an interesting quote from uh, Son of Shandasani from his introduction to the, the, uh, the paperback, the 50th anniversary paperback. In his prefatory note, Jung wrote that he had been occupied with the central problem of the book for years. And no wonder, for it was in answer to Job that the theology first articulated in the Liber Novus, the Red Book, the themes of progressive incarnation of the God, the necessity of Christification, and the replacement of the one-sided Christian God image with one that encompassed evil within it, found its definite expression and elaboration. In Jung's fantasies during World War I, a new God had been born in his soul. The God who is the son of the frogs, the son of the earth, Abraxas. That's a pretty interesting statement. Here's much more contemporary in 1995, Jack Miles, who was, a, uh, was once a uh, Jesuit priest. Job becomes the starting point in the life of God, reading that life as a movement from self-ignorance to self-knowledge. The Lord's inscrutable ways have been made all too scrutable, and the encounter with Job has changed both God and humankind. Job changes the subject, making God's righteousness rather than his own the question on the reader's mind, and ultimately on God's own mind as well. After Job, God knows his own ambiguity as he has never known before. So Edward Edinger starts off his look at uh, the book of Job, or as the answer to Job, uh, with these eight points of understanding. And I actually have the original recordings of the book uh, I was based on. Um, and he's very clear. Um, he says, if you don't understand these eight points of understanding, you're not going to get the book of Job. First, and this is a, this is a quote from uh, Jung, number one, the book of Job is a landmark in the long historical development of the divine drama. The evolving God image is really what he's talking to, about here. And Job is a landmark in the evolving God image drama. The affect corresponds to the violence of the deed that caused it. The affect or the emotions, our feeling state, corresponds to the violence of the deed that caused it. Edinger says, our affects are the inner manifestations of Yahweh. Now this is a this is an interesting concept and it's hard for me to really totally get my mind around this, but he's very strong. Edinger says, we like to talk about my love, my hate. And he says, no, our emotions come from the unconscious. They're not ours. We don't own them. We live them. Um, it's interesting. It's a very interesting idea. Book of Job serves as a paradigm for a certain experience of God, which has a very, very special significance for our time. This again is a quote from Jung. So it's, a, it's 
there's a paradigm in the book of Job that's of particular significance now. And in particular, the Job is a guiding model for the sufferings of the modern ego. That's interesting. I think part of our discussion that we just had a moment ago touched on this idea. The one thing I wonder about this is that, you know, we don't live in the modern world anymore. We live in the postmodern world or maybe even later. Um, we're not the same. We don't think the same, but still, I think this language applies. Item four of Edinger's eight points of understanding. God is at odds with himself, an antimony, a totality of inner opposites. We're talking Jungian psychology all the time about the union of the opposites and basically saying that God is the union of all opposites. It's like we said, uh, uh, I think we, I don't remember if I presented this here, but in the Garden of Eden, um, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, the Hebrews did things like that, and they don't mean good and evil necessarily. They're talking, they're, they, they would pair up opposites like that. And what they mean is good and evil and everything in between. It was the tree of all knowledge. And the same idea here. Um, and that's why, you know, we have this idea. We've heard this from a number of Jungian teachers that the ego's attitude toward the unconscious largely determines the face that the unconscious will show us. The attitude with which we approach the unconscious in our lives, the unconscious comes right back at us with that. It doesn't matter. You come with this attitude, we come with that attitude. Why? Because it's all there. It's the union of, of opposites. It's all, it's like the tree of all knowledge. It's all there. And that's why it'll come back just the way we approach it. This interesting statement, Yahweh's incal incalculable moods and devastating attacks of wrath. The point, uh, and as Edinger explains it, is that the unconscious is very much like an archaic king or an archaic queen. It's, I'm in charge and you're going to do what I say um, or else. Um, and uh, basically saying that this is what the unconscious is like. Um, and that it's, you know, Yahweh as a symbol of that unconscious, that living unconscious is what we have to deal with in our lives. He also points out the difference between Yahweh and Zeus, or as he said, Father Zeus. Zeus was concerned with human beings uh, when they disobeyed, like if they stole fire, or something like that, um, but otherwise wasn't really involved or concerned about human affairs, but not the same with Yahweh. Yahweh underwent a transformation when he insisted on becoming the only God. That's what Ebinger says. And he is involved in all human affairs. Number seven, now this is actually a really important point beyond just the book of Job, the forever covenant between Yahweh and David has been broken. Um, this was the third covenant. God, God made three different covenants over time. And the final one was between Yahweh and King David. And it repeatedly, King, it doesn't matter how you behave. Up until this point, behavior was important. But now that David was king, your behavior doesn't, it doesn't matter. What, however it is that you behave, David's kingdom will last forever. But that covenant has been broken. Babylon came down and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. And large sections of the Old Testament, the Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomist, whoever that writer was, it might have been Jeremiah, Jeremiah himself, the prophets, all are trying to explain why that happened. God made this promise. David's kingdom is forever, but it fell. And once again, it comes back to uh, man's behavior. Israel was a harlot, on and on and on. But this is important. The covenant was 
broken. And what Edinger says is that this is because God isn't quite conscious of what he's doing. He needs us to get that consciousness. Existence is only real when it is conscious to somebody. It's another idea from uh, Jung. Edinger says the basic feature of the unconscious is that it needs to be seen. It's kind of narcissism. Uh, that's the word that he used. I don't remember if uh, Jung used that word himself, but that's the idea here is that the unconscious is narcissistic and it needs and wants to be seen. Um, and those are the eight points of understanding, which Edinger says, if you don't get these points, um, answer to Joe will be lost to you because this is where Jung was coming from. And I'd like to add to those points, uh, this really important issue that comes up again and again um, uh, von Franz really talks about this a lot. Um, the reality of the psyche. Um, and the difference between physical facts and psychic facts. So we live in we live in a world now, the secular scientific world that we live in ha has to be measurable. Uh, has to, you have to be able to touch things. They have to be physical. Um, I know as a doctor in medicine, you know, this is the thing. If you can't demonstrate it, if you can't measure it, if you can't put your hands on it, if you can't see it, um, it's not real. It's one of the reasons psychiatry still is a little bit of bastard child of medicine, you know, even though it's become more of a medical science, um, you know, with uh, the medications that are available now. Um, but again, um, the point here is that religious truths are psychic truths. They're not physical truths. Um, that doesn't mean they're not real. I mean, it's the same thing as saying myth. A myth is not something that's untrue. It's something that's very, very true. It really happened. Now, I can give you a real uh, kind of a cheap example of how this works in the brain. This is from a neurological point of view. What we know about people when they dream, when you go into REM sleep and you're paralyzed, and you can't move, so you can't act out the thing that you're dreaming. The brain creates what they call a full motor set um, and acts it out in the brain, in the, and that's the dream that you have. And from the brain's point of view, it really happened. As far as the brain is concerned, it really happened. And this is kind of touching on the idea of the reality of the psyche. Um, what it's not touching on is the fact that the psyche is alive and well, and um, there are entities in there. The psyche is an autonomous factor. The unconscious is autonomous. Uh, by definition, it's unknowable. Um, we can know this, we can know that, maybe, but it's beyond, I mean, it's beyond our conscious ability to understand it. The archetypes are not objects, they are subjects. That's what I was just saying a moment ago. Um, they're entities. When we talk about the anima, it's not just a thing, it's a living thing. Um, as I've heard people say sometimes, I mean, the unconscious is, it's unconscious to us, but it's not unconscious in another way. I mean, it's very much alive and um, interactive. And then consciousness is dependent. Um, the point here being that the ground of our being, to use Paul Tillich's phrase, is our unconscious selves. Our consciousness arises out of our unconscious self. And this is particularly true in uh, uh, you know, childhood development, but it's, it's true as we go along. It's, uh, we get into analysis or if we just do what kind of inner work we do, um, consciousness comes out of our unconscious. I'm going to quickly uh, run through a little more of Edinger because uh, he says there are these particular issues of psychological insight um, that are in Jung's answer to Job. Um, one of them is the idea of being the chosen one or the chosen ones. And 
Um, these were the Hebrews. They were God's chosen people. Now the Christians nowadays would say they are God's chosen people. It's a, and this is a central theme of individuation, which is that I am going to now embark on my path of individuation and become the, per, per, the person that I was meant to be. That cho I'm chosen. I have, you know, uh, Hillman talked about, you know, the acorn theory. There's this thing in ourselves that we're born with, that we're destined to become, and yet our lives interfere with it and keep it from happening until we actually are, you know, get conscious about it. Individual ego steps into a personal, unique fate, is what I'm saying. Weakness and defeat, another psychological point that Edinger points out, these are necessary to become conscious. Now, this is certainly true in childhood development. Uh, a child who never experiences weakness and defeat will not become a healthy adult. A you know, prime example is you are not supposed to win the Oedipal conflict. And there are kids who do win the Oedipal conflict and they are not healthy adults. Um, That's just one example. But we do have these stages of development where we're, we have to lose in order to gain, in order to grow, in order to mature. And then both the ego and the self are transformed when that happens. And the archetypes cannot otherwise evolve this has been a really interesting idea to me because I'm hearing people now, John Beebe talked about it when he was interviewed here in this group about the anima. And I also heard him say this uh, when he talked about the anima in the Jungian film uh, school that I went to just a few months ago, um, that um, the archetypes evolve. The anima that's in us is not the same anima that was in humans a hundred years ago, and certainly not the same anima of a thousand years ago. Our anima has evolved, it's changed, it's a different anima, um, and we need to get to know it on a whole different set of terms. That's an example. Compensation is another bit of psychological insight. When the ego becomes one-sided, we all know this idea, the unconscious constellates the opposite to create a balance. Um, when we deny things about ourselves or deny parts of reality, well, it's, what I used to say to my patients is that that thing that you're repressing, you're putting a lot of energy into it, <laughs> a lot of energy going into you know, holding that thing down. And what happens is it uh, constellates, it creates a balance, it creates a whole because that stuff is all in there. This is an interesting point that Edinger makes, and he says, we're not talking about the external world here, but consciously perceived injustice creates or constellates justice within us, in our unconscious. If we perceive that things are unjust or we are being treated unfairly within ourselves, Justice. Now, that's a confusing idea. It's another idea that it's hard to really totally get. But it's an interesting idea. But it's about compensation. Thus, the God image is transformed. The Cunyunctio. His knowledge attains a divine luminosity. I believe that's the comes from Jung, but it certainly comes from Edinger. Um, what this is referring to is that the ego and self partnership creates consciousness, and it's based on the idea that Adam, and I think this is coming up, uh, the Adam, the human, was created in God's image, which means there is a, a, a numinosity to human uh, consciousness. Um, and the ego self partnership helps create that consciousness. Edinger talks about the dialectic and the self. The dialectic is the coming together of opposites. It's, it comes more from a philosophical point of view. 
But the ego's participation brings about a union of the opposites within. And so this is, again, our involvement, our engagement with the unconscious creates a union of opposites within. But what's interesting about that is conscious awareness externally causes a meaningful transformation of the unconscious parts of ourselves. So this is exactly what Answer to Job is all about. Things change on the inside um, when we consciously work on it. Again, here's the Adam was created in the image of God. Job is challenged as though, as though he himself were a God. The ego has this numinous quality because it's created in the image of God. This is an interesting, strange statement. He can behold the back of Yahweh, the abysmal world of shards. It comes from answer to Job. It's quoting Jung. I understand the first part. It's a reference. The, the back of Yahweh is a reference to Moses. Uh, when Moses uh, was up on Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, uh, getting the Ten Commandments, I mean, there was lightning and thunder and the voice of God, and everybody heard it. And he came down with the stones, the tablets, and they were worshiping the golden calf. And Moses smashes the stones and goes back up. What happens then is that he has an encounter with God and he insists that God reveal himself and show himself to Moses. And God refuses. And it goes round and round. Finally, God says, okay, all right, we'll do it, but we're going to do it my way. And what it says is that he put Moses into the cleft of the rock and put his hand across to cover him so he wouldn't be fully exposed and then walked by and Moses caught a glimpse of the back of God. And that's an interesting story. And then he gets another set of tablets after that, and he goes back down. The second one, the world of shards, is a reference to the Kabbalah. And um, I'm going to just leave it at that. And uh, perhaps stoke your curiosity and you can examine that for yourself. But it's, what it means is that as the self manifests, it splits again. There's a unity and then it splits again, uh, which again is an interesting idea. The unconscious has an animal nature. It's another bit of psychological insight. Therefore, it cannot be judged by human moral standards. Our conscious selves can be, but our unconscious, no. And this is why, I mean, it's a cliche in psychiatry sometimes, is, you know, I, I am not responsible for the things that happen in my dreams, you know, the crimes that I commit or whatever. Now, that's not fully true because, because of compensation. Uh, very often what I dream is uh, precisely about you know, what's going on in my personal life. But the unconscious as a whole cannot be judged by human moral standards. Likewise, Yahweh is a phenomenon. Um, the unconscious is the phenomenon. It's something that's active, something that it's alive, but it has an animal nature and isn't fully aware. It, doesn't lack, it lacks reflection in the way that we reflect. Job finally gets satisfaction. And perhaps without Yahweh intending or without knowing it. Um, and God too, says Edinger, is an amoral force of nature. In spite of his impotence, man is set up as a judge over God himself. So, of all of his books, this is the one. Jung later said that he would have liked to have rewritten all of his books, except this one. He was happy with Answer to Job, and he just left it because uh, it said what it was that he wanted to say. I think that's an interesting point. And in conclusion, 
I, and this one is close to my heart because this is the other course that I have taught, uh, 10 lectures on Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet, um, Rainer Maria Rilke. And again, this is an example of these ideas are old. These ideas have been there. Listen to what Rilke said in 1923 in a letter. The sonnets to Orpheus were intended to show the identity of dreadfulness and bliss. These two faces of the same divine head, indeed this one single face, which just presents itself this way or that, according to the distance from which or the state of mind in which we perceive it. Whoever does not, sometime or another, with final decisiveness, accept, indeed give joyous consent to, the dreadfulness of life, can never take possession of the unutterable sovereign powers of our existence, can only go along its edge, and when the judgment is made, will have been neither alive nor dead. I've, I've only found one reference, a letter that Young wrote to a woman who asked him about Rilke, um, in which he showed that he was familiar with Rilke and he identified with Rilke and understood that Rilke had done a very important inner kind of work. And that's it. I, I don't know of any other connection um, between Young and Rilke, though they certainly lived at the same time. They both spoke German. Um, living in the same world. Anyway, uh, that's what I have to say about the book of Job and Young's answer to Job. As I say, there's a whole additional portion to Young's answer that has to do with uh, the New Testament, starting with uh, you know, the incarnation and ending with uh, uh, with the Book of Revelation, um, and I'll, I'll just mention, you know, basically the idea that he uh, talks about there um, that God had two sons, and one of them was Christ, and the other was Satan, and that at the beginning of the Christian era, we get to have the Christ part. At the end of the Christian era, we get the other part, and we get the Book of Revelation and the Apocalypse, and well, I'll tell you, like, we feel like we've been living through it here with our orange skies and our smoke and our virus, and I'll tell you, <laughs> whatever. But anyway, there we go. We can have a little more discussion now. And uh, people have something in particular to say, I'd like to hear it. I see Colleen uh, has. Yes. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, so much. Beautiful, beautifully put. Mm, it's always been an enigma to me, and I, um, uh, this is really beautifully put. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. A great prelude to um, what I'm going to be talking about in terms of creativity, which uh, the time has come for a need, not only for a new image of God, but a new image of creativity. Mm. Um, I want to, uh, what you say reminds me of uh, Robert Johnson's, uh, in his book of He, he talks about Jung's uh, saying that there comes a time uh, in our adolescence when we are unjustly accused of something. As Jung was, uh, as an adolescent, he, his teacher unjustly accused him of plagiarism. Uh, so, um, Jung says that at that time, uh, if the mother rushes in to save the son, or the father rushes in to save the daughter, uh, they will not learn the lesson of the evil, that there is this dark side of God, and at that age, they must learn that this is true of life. Mm -hmm. If they don't learn this, they will look for an adult figure to protect them for the rest of their lives until they get that lesson. I thought it was so well put, and I thought Jung's example of what happened to him 
by being unjustly accused. And in the video about him, he says, if I were to see this teacher on the street today, I would kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so accepting of his own uh, darkness. So thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you so thank you. Thank you. I certainly, in my life, in my personal life, my professional life, I've had those experiences where you've been accused of something and there is nothing you can do about it. You know, nothing. And there's no experience in life like that. I mean, and you have to, you do, you have to go through it. You have to learn the lesson. Yes. You know? I'm interested in the movement from unconscious suffering to conscious suffering, because I think that makes the difference and whether our suffering is useful or useless. And I, so I'm trying to understand how can I become someone who consciously suffers? And I think what I've learned about this is that it has to do with our consent. And that if we freely give our consent to the suffering, it becomes conscious suffering. Mm. But I also think that it's important to remember that there's a part of us that never accepts the suffering and that that too is a part of the process and is, is meant to be a part of the process. Because yeah. we can't just willy-nilly accept it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think young, I, th I think Joe was angry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At the unfairness of it, yes. I'd just like to know if, if, others from different religious backgrounds from me um, actually understood that religion was talking about the unconscious when, when they were growing up or into, into their middle or late age. Uh, because in terms of what I was exposed to in religion, which was Protestant sort of plain vanilla um, military chaplain, Protestant chaplain, um, with a little bit of reformed, uh, reformed Calvinism intermixed. I never understood, and I don't think the, the ministers understood, that they were talking about the unconscious. And so, I mean, I'd like to hear from people like Nancy and others whether whether they, whether you were consciously aware based on your upbringing and based on what you knew and how you were trained that you were talking about the unconscious. When Certainly you... in my life, that was never the case. I think as a child, I knew it intuitively mm -hmm. because in Sunday school, we would come and hear the Bible stories and those were very real to me, the uh, characters and what they were doing. But so you knew that it, they were inside you. No, no. But my response was, I mean, there was a, there was a relationship to them. Yeah, sure. Cer but no but understanding, no, under, no understanding that it had to do with the unconscious. Right. Is there anybody that did did have the understanding that it had to do with the unconscious? Well, uh, I, I had an experience as a as a young child when my mother was putting me to bed, and somehow the the phrase "the kingdom of heaven is within" was wow. spoken, and um, and it was a moment that I that I have never forgotten. And uh, when I heard the Bible stories and everything else, I I didn't really related to that. I didn't relate those characters to, to, to part, you know, things that were, were within me. Um, but, um, you know, later in, in my life, when I was able to um, apply my intellect more to this whole thing, um, it, uh, I, I, I could begin to do that. But I think without that formative experience, which was not like so many things along my process that have been meaningful, it's not an intellectual uh, affair. It's a knowing. And I think that that original experience for me sort of set the tone for a lifetime of, of this work. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, 
I didn't get it. I, I, I somehow I missed it entirely, and um, it it was only because of reading Jung that I started to appreciate it. I mean, when I read paragraph seven fifty two of Jung of Answer to Job, in which he says every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche, not a statement of the physis. Um, you know, the penny dropped at that moment, but I was already almost in my 70s before um, that happened, or, you know, whenever I started to look at Answer to Job, not more than a decade ago. And, and so, you know, then, then it all rushed in, and I said, oh my God, what has happened to humanity that, that, um, theologians have been allowed to put God entirely external, okay? And I mean, this is what one of the points that Jung made about, uh, he said several times that, that uh, Americans are uh, totally extroverted, the most extroverted people in the world. And I, I actually didn't understand that because I had studied the MBTI. And so I knew I was introverted, quite introverted um, as a personality trait, but, but he wasn't talking about it as a personality trait. He was talking about internal and external. And, and so even when I was reading about the, the transcendent function years ago, probably 20 years ago, and so on. I was not, I was not connecting to it at all in that way. Uh, and because the, the word introversion or extroversion is used somewhat differently, it never came to me. And so, you know, that, that raises the question of uh, paragraph 754 of uh, Answer to Job, uh, where uh, Jung says, um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, he says, um, uh, he, he's talking about the, about the idea of the assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven. And he said, um, you know, the great task is of reinterpreting all of Christian traditions. But I think it, the great task is reinterpreting all religions in, in terms of modern categories of understanding. As, as Ed, Edinger put it later, I think he said, uh, all religions need to be re reinterpreted in the context of modern categories of understanding. And because basically now in the modern time, and let's say from 1500 on to the time of Nietzsche, um, we were starting to realize how we had been led astray. It didn't work. It didn't, it didn't dawn on anybody until then, because up until then, everybody just believed whatever the church told them, and they followed the rules. And if the church wants to burn somebody at the stake, fine, let them do it. That's, you know, that's their business, and they're talking to God. But you know what, the, <laughs> you know, uh, the fact that now, um, I know in the Reformed Church of America, because uh, Paul Vanderclay from Sacramento has said this a number of times, that he has been told to stay away from you, to only teach in the old way. Mm -hmm. And so if everybody's going to be stubborn, and, and insist on teaching in the old way, then humanity cannot develop. Humanity can't 
reinterpret based on where we are from a scientific point of view. So we have this clash going on and I'm, I'm sure John has probably seen plenty of people in, in his clinic that are really confused, mm -hmm. because, right? And yeah, very much so. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that modern men really, particularly, and I'll blame it particularly on men and, and the logos, um, understand what needs to be done and what, it, what would be beneficial. I mean, go ahead. I'll shut up. I, I don't know if it is relevant to your question. I have been brought up as a, as a Christian Orthodox. And I have an experience around five where uh, I, I, I started experiencing my, my body as matter. And my body as, as I don't know, I, I can't easily describe, but in that feeling, there was a godly sense of something in my body. I, I had access to that through physical pain around that age and in, ch in church um, where I could see myself levitating in very ecstatic um, notes, notes of chanting. You know, the Orthodox chanting is very mm -hmm. Um I, I, I suspect that there might be a potential answer to your question that as further, and I think Jung may address that in his books on alchemy and von Franz a little bit, I think, may touch on that. Uh, w working towards matter and the body and darkening it, um, uh, civilization gradually lost the embodiment and the chthonic aspect of all the religions, uh, losing thus the ability to connect with taking religion within rather than without um, but that may, might not be the case it's i'm only drawing from my experience uh, at five uh, and, and speculate that yeah well i mean what what shocked me and some of you know this experience of mine but when in on february the 22nd 1999 um, my daughter, who I had separated from her mother when she was, let's say, 12, and this was her 22nd birthday, um, and, but we had stayed quite close, and we still are quite close. I was emailing with her today, um, but she had gone to Russia uh, on a USIS fellowship, and she, she, while she was there, she fell in with a group of born again Christians and of some sort, I don't even know what sort, but she had just come back and I took her out to dinner in uh, Washington, just the two of us. We had a perfectly lo lovely dinner for three hours. And at the end of it, she said, well, dad, I'm sorry to say this to you, but I think you're going to hell, quote unquote. Okay, and in that moment, I dropped into hell, and on the drive home, I had a vision of Mephistopheles dropping down in the seat next to me, and this took, this was a five or second, a 10 second incident, but during this incident, um, I cut the Faustian bargain, which was that he could have my immortal soul on my death provided uh, that none of my daughters think that of me for the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, that what, fortunately, I didn't fall into what Ann Ulanoff calls the devil's trick, because it's very easy in that sort of a circumstance to get angry with your daughter. And I didn't get angry with my daughter. I got angry with the people who taught her to say that. Who, who teaches a child to say such a thing to their parent? Um, and, you know, that's the weaponization of religion. And, and so it, it really strikes me that we have to really, humanity really has to rethink 
religion because here in this group we only had one person out of all of us and we're all interested in this <laughs> that said that they understood or two people I guess who said they understood that uh, that religion was about the unconscious okay and um, you know, Jung put it very bluntly. Uh, I assume, John, you know this book, the the new God image. Uh huh. The new God image. Okay. Well, yeah. this is an Edinger book, but basically, it's Edinger just putting in a appendix, which is half the book, uh, fourteen of Jung's letters, and what he did was he pulled together um, some of the you know, most direct things that Jung ever said about the God image. And, um, and I, there's one paragraph for, um, well, there's one paragraph that really sums it all up. And it's in a letter uh, to David Cox dated September the 25th, 1957. So Jung is 81 years old when he's writing this letter. And this is the paragraph, I'll just read it to you. Um, Although all this sounds as if it were a sort of theological speculation, it is in reality modern man's perplexity expressed in symbolic terms. It is the problem I so often had to deal with in treating the neuroses of intelligent patients. It can be expressed in a more scientific psychological language. For instance, instead of using the term God, you say unconscious. Instead of Christ, self. Instead of incarnation, integration of the unconscious. Instead of salvation or redemption, individuation instead of crucifixion or sacrifice on the cross, realization of the four functions or of wholeness. I think it is no disadvantage to religious tradition if we can see how far it coincides with psychological experience. On the contrary, it seems to me a most welcome aid in understanding religious traditions. And um, I've often been critical because even the people who were around Jung's um, writing and who were doing commentaries on it hid this. They hid this this statement, and it 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 does appear in the collected works. It's in volume 18 of the collected works, volume 18. So you have to be pretty committed to even get to it, and it's in paragraph 1664 of volume 18. <laughs> so you have to you have to really without Edinger to pull this one up uh, you know I probably would have been buried for another century or more maybe forever who knows. Sorry uh, can you give again the reference where Jung writes this paragraph? Okay, you can find it in, um, I think you can find it in, um, in letters, uh, this particular letter. It's a letter to David Cox, and it's dated, and it's the Reverend David Cox, and it's dated uh, September the 25th, 1957. Okay. And um, it's, it, it's carried... I mean, what's more important and easier to find is this book, okay? The New God Image by Edward Edinger, okay? And what he did was he he's pulled together, it's a study of Jung's key letters concerning the evolution of the Western God Image. And so that's the easiest place to find it. But in the collected works, you can find it in volume 18, uh, volume 18 is called The Symbolic Life. And so if you go to volume 18, it's in paragraph 1664. What I just read was paragraph 1664. Um, Thank you very much. And um, I was just looking for my copy of that book, but I realized it's over at Sherry's. 
Yeah, but also I would I would say that I've read all these letters. They are on my YouTube channel. Um, and uh, let me see if I can find the playlist quickly uh, because uh, I think I've, um, I think I've read it. I mean, I think I can put my finger in it on it. Let's see. Uh, unfortunately, now I've I've overdone myself, and I've got eleven hundred videos here, so I have to figure out how I've characterized it. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, Before we get to the end, I'm wondering, Doreen, are you still here with us? Excuse me. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, you. I, I know that you've written a paper about Answer to Job, and um, you said earlier in the beginning that you had something else you wanted to say. Oh, you know, I've realized since then that I know very little, so, <laughs> so I was just uh, reverted to listening. I mean, um, I did in my coursework, uh, I was captivated by uh, the book of Job and did, uh, you know, I was captivated mainly by how God describes himself, but I'm, that's not important to me right now. I, I like where this is going, but thank you so much for following up. Sure. With me. sure. Yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Sherry, you uh, joined us uh, af after, but the reason Doreen is here is that she's a friend of Julie Perkins. Yes, and I, I, know I, know much, <laughs> I, I know how much Julie loves uh, all of you, and this is the, my first entree. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that, Skip, you have so many YouTube readings of these different things has really caught my attention. So yeah, I, your channel. I actually read all these letters, but um, amazingly, I can, at this moment, I cannot find it. <laughs> And uh, I'm afraid, I'm a, right now, I'm afraid to go onto my Chrome application because I'll, I'm afraid it, it will uh, sully our YouTube uh, recording. So I'm not going on on Chrome. If I was on Chrome, I could find it quickly. But, um, but anyway, if, if anybody wants to write to me at skip.conover, I'll just put that into the chat and say you like uh, the link, I'll be able to find it shortly and I can send you the link uh, to that playlist. Uh, wait, wait a minute, there's one other place I can look. I could just look under playlists, wouldn't that be smart? Just a moment. Playlists, all playlists. So John, uh, do you have more to your talk by, by chance? On the book of Job? Yes, or was uh, is this now the discussion? Is it, Did you have more presentation? Oh, that's the presentation. That is it. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. No, you're right. There's, there's a lot of the book of, uh, you know, it's a lot of the book that I did not go into, but that's because I intentionally, throughout the whole series, restricted myself to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Um, yes. Yeah. And I know that that's contrary to traditional Jungian thought, but I really wanted to de delve into those stories. And as you know, we know so much more now about Hebrew and about you know the culture that they came out of. And I wanted to bring those stories to life and let them speak for themselves. Um, okay. Here, so often we're told what those stories are. You know. Well, one question. I I did have that I wrote down uh, was, uh, and it may be answered in this new, um, in the uh, Edinger's new book about the, the new God, right? Um, but I was curious about the mysterious, um, not necessarily religious in the religiosity sense, but spiritual and the energetic in the, in uh, having to do with Jung's also his interest in uh, what wasn't psychological, uh, 
what, you know, like his pans talking to him in the kitchen and uh, this, you know, things like that. So um, has that uh, captivated you at all beyond the um, sort of the scholarly approach to the scriptures, to the Bible? I, I think, yes, absolutely. I think that is completely fascinating. Um, um, I mean, these, yes, we're talking about the unconscious, uh, but we experience the unconscious as if it's outside of ourselves. Yes. And we experience it in the external world. Um, and some people, was clearly one of them. Um, uh, uh, like William Blake, I think, was another one. Maybe uh, Swedenborg, you know. Uh, really experienced it in a very personal way. Uh, an opportunity, you know, where you have, we can uh, actually have a conversation. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. I, we seem to be getting another interference here. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm interested in what was said in the very beginning, John, about the word surrender and yeah. how that was different than other, another way to portray what Job had done, which was more to submit. Mm -hmm. And just right. to say that I think that's a very important point because surrender is a common concept in mysticism and religious life, that it's, it's not... It's not a submission. It's a, it's a willing surrender. Yes. And I do think that's that's really significant. Yeah. Hi, Colleen. Yeah. It that uh, reminds me of a lesson I received when in uh, Japan at the Omoto Foundation. Uh, I was studying with a calligraphy teacher. And we were to choose a word, and he would give us the uh, symbols for it. And my word was surrender. And I wanted to know how to do the calligraphy of surrender. And there were two characters uh, that I needed to learn. And so, um, and the teacher said, I said, what do these characters mean? And he said, it's not necessary for you to know. You just practice the symbols and you'll, you know, you'll find out. So. I did, and uh, after a little while, he said, well, maybe you'd like to know what those symbols mean. <laughs> and then he offered it up that the top symbol, there were two symbols. The top one is to give oneself, and the bottom symbol is as a dog. <laughs> oh, that's very interesting, because I, w I wanted to tell you a story about surrender that relates to a dog. Um, and it has to do with unconscious instinct, I think. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, uh, one time, I was running away from a German shepherd that was very vicious. And this shepherd was just coming after me, you know, and I was running away. And then suddenly, instinctually, I simply stopped and turned around and looked at the dog and he stopped and walk away. And, and so that, that was a kind of surrender that came from the unconscious. And obviously it's, it's something that developed in the human species as a way to, to deal with a predator, um, you know, and millions of years before there were humans, I suppose. The tenth lecture is called The Disappearance of God. Uh -huh. it, it covers two different things. One is what happens in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is that, you know, in the beginning in Eden, God is physically walking around. You can hear the sound of him walking, you know, mm. in, you know that's why Adam and Eve hid. And it, it, his physical presence remains. It, it, it kind of hits a peak, I think, uh, on, uh, up on Mount Sinai, when the Ten Commandments, um, you know, the elders go up and, you know, God is seen and there's a real physical presence. 
But from that point on, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, God gradually disappears. He speaks like, you know, less and less, only to the prophets, and then barely, and by the end, you get to the Bible, and, you know, there's, like, what is it, Esther? He's not even mentioned in the book of Esther. And that's also happened in our culture. God has disappeared from our culture. Mm -hmm. And I want, you know, I want to combine in that lecture uh, a discussion of who were, you know, when did this happen? How did this happen? Who were the individuals that really were the key players? You know, we always talk about Nietzsche, but it was going on before Nietzsche. Nietzsche was oh, long before, recognizing yeah. something that had happened and kind of prophesying what would happen to a, a, cult, you know, a culture that loses its God-centeredness. What does it become about then? You know, it becomes about power. Yeah. Well, so, I think, I, you know, I, th I wonder if we don't see the performance of God mm -hmm. uh, in our collective unconscious now. I, I mean, based on what Jung said to David Cox, um, which I did put the link to all those letters that I read so that you can find that playlist, but, um, but the, um, you know, if, if we think of the collective unconscious as God, as, and as representing God, and God does change with humanity, and humanity changes with God, which is sort of the uh, participatory imaginal that uh, Becca Tarnas spoke of, uh, a couple of Sundays ago on, on our YouTube channel, um, where we're actually seeing, um, you know, from my point of view, uh, we, we kind of are seeing our president acting out Yahweh and, and, um, and we're seeing the transformation of God uh, from from a time. Well, I mean, I, the way I would see it is from a time when um, in in Germany everybody was ha, was of the, uh, of a similar mind. So the collective unconscious in Weimar Germany was um, everyone was of a similar mind, and so when somebody introduced a, an idea into the collective, it got swept up and it became a psychic ep epidemic very easily. But in the United States, where uh, we have a collective unconscious that's made up of people from every nationality group in on earth, every language, every religion, uh, it's not so easy to spread a, a psychic epidemic. We obviously have seen it spread uh, in the last four years, but nonetheless, it's not as easy to take over a whole country or our whole country as compared to, to that time. Mm. And, it, and, it, and it does happen in, in other countries. I mean, I've seen it happen in Turkey, for example. Any thoughts about that? I think what you said is very interesting, yeah. Um, we're, in a way, that's, you know, the fact that we're divided in this country protects us yeah. from that kind, of, uh, that kind of thing. You're right. Yeah. It's, it's actually our diversi diversity that protects us and makes us strong. Um, Very much so. Yeah. And, and the truth does out over time. I mean, it's a, it's a clash and, um, you know, other countries don't um, other countries don't understand it. They say, how can you have all these debates all the time? And why are you Americans always fighting with each other? But that's what we do. But that's over time, truth emerges. And it doesn't mean we can't make a mistake. Um, and we'll see what happens um, in November. But, um, you know, my expectation is that that uh, we'll have a, a certain result, but if we don't have that result four years hence, we're going to have had a lot more painful lessons. Eventually the, the truth will emerge <laughs> of what God wants. 
thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm having to go to the MailChimp chimp deal for email reminders because of some countries requiring uh, people to opt in to be on an email uh, thing. A few weeks ago when we were doing one of these things, I had about 300 um, emails that I sent out bounce because they were considered spam and, and uh, Gmail wouldn't put them through. And so because my list has grown dramatically, uh, I have to have you opt in to my list and then you can be sure to get notices of these events. And so uh, today was uh, within the Wisdom Path Colloquium category, but you can sign up for any of the categories that are at that. If you go to that link, you'll see the place to put in your name and your email address and what you want to get notices about. Mm -hmm.